Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Shane Yass. As you can see in my slide, I'm doing my project on psychological and sociological causes of uh, children among specifically elite junior tennis players. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my advisors, Dr. Esther Fleischman, here on the right from Biological Sciences, Dr. Anderson from Psychology on the left, you know, my, um, my IDS advisor, Carrie, thank you for everything. And I'd also like to thank the whole department. You know, I'm really uh, happy to be part of this, uh, this department. I think we do a lot of great things. You know, and I'm, I'm really excited to see what everyone does in the future. I also want to thank you to Julie, my, my partner in uh, 480, helping me out. You know, my teammates who came out, my friends who came out. And you know, thank you for coming here. You guys have been, you know, through every step with me. So, it's nice to see you guys here. So, let me begin. So, I want you to look at this picture first. And I want you to tell me who this girl is and if you can tell me who the guy is. Any takers? Besides my teammates. <laughs> She's a tennis player and he's a coach. Yeah, well, that's, that's Anna Kornikova. You've probably heard of her. Um, you know, not because of her tennis ability, but <laughs> because, you know, but that, that, that's besides the point. This is probably taken 20 years ago at the Voluntary Tennis Academy. That's Nick Voluntary. You know, um, so she joined the academy around, you know, eight, nine years old from Russia. So, and he's also like pretty much the guru of, you know, specialized tennis academy for juniors in Florida. So he started it all with Sampras and Agassiz. He's he's the head honcho. So the purpose of my uh, of my of my capstone project. First, I wanted to show you guys that you know injuries are not just simply anatomical, just one physical happening in a you know in a competition or in practice that happens you know to part of the body, especially on, on focusing on the shoulder. But there's actually psychological and sociological uh, implications, underlying factors that actually cause these injuries beforehand. So first, my methodology. Um, I conducted a, a literature search. I, uh, I panned through journals and articles to find supporting uh, information on what I was looking for. And secondly, I did a cultural analysis. You know, I've been immersed in this culture, this tennis world, for maybe 14, 15 years now. So I brought in a lot of personal insights, a lot of personal experiences, you know, um, so to help me you know, propel this project forward. So the first discipline that I used was biology, mainly anatomy and physiology. Um, they give me the actual physical makeup of the body and you know what, what an actual injury is. And the second uh, discipline I use is psychology, which um, it, it, it kind of showed me how the mind and body works, you know, how it's connected, how the mind affects the body, you know how can it affect injuries and how can it, it can affect health. And uh, lastly, I use sociology. Um, uh, sociology, sociology norms and ideals. You know it affects the uh, it affects the athlete and it affects the person and it can affect you know, the environment that that athlete is performing in. So for my first bridging, bridging strategy, it was checks and balances. So in, so, in uh, sociology, an American ideal and American norm is winning in competition. You know, we live in a very capitalistic society nowadays, you can tell, you know, with our economy. And so that spills into athletics and sports and pretty much every other aspect of, uh, of our lives. So players, coaches, uh, parents, they want the kids to win. And they're willing to do anything. To, they're willing to do anything to get to that to that goal. And that, that's checked by biology and anatomy, because the body, especially among uh, junior athletes, you know, it can only do so much. It can only take so much. Um, the body can only go through so much in a match or in practice competition before the the body breaks down and go, goes into injury. So the second bridging strategy that I used was a building uh, complex multicausal explanations. So I borrowed. Uh, concepts and models from uh, psychology and sociology in order to describe um, why these injuries occurred in, uh, in athletes. So a model that I used in psychology was uh, coined by Anderson and Williams called the stress and injury model. In essence, um, if you're a sport participant, if you experience a stressful situation, you're more likely to um, experience an injury. And something I took from uh, sociology were ideology and norms. And you know, as I said before, winning competition, those ideologies and norms that are made in society are spill into and affect athletics. So first, let me give you a brief profile of the uh, junior tennis player. Of course, they have to be 18 and below. Uh, there are you know, exceptions in professional tennis. There are ju uh, 18 and below uh, professional athletes. But because they're still eligible to compete in the junior events, they're still considered you know, these junior athletes. And I also want to touch on, they compete at the national and international level. So they're competing 
uh, among the uh, uh, other elite junior athletes around the world. So before I can talk about uh, the actual shoulder injuries, I want to give you a brief anatomy lesson. So first, the shoulder is made up of three muscle, uh, three bones. Sorry, uh, the clavicle, the scapula, and the <clears throat> and the the humerus. The humerus is right here. The scapula, the clavicle, and the uh, the scapula and the humerus create this joint called the glenohumeral joint, and that is pretty much the ball and socket joint. That's what you think of when you think of the shoulder. That's the joint you think of. And here's the side view of the scapula, and um, here's the glenohumeral cavity. This is where the head of the humerus actually sits. And in this cavity, there's a, there's a rim of cartilage, fibrocartilage called the labrum. And that, created, that creates an increased surface area between the head, uh, at head and the glenoid cavity. So the, the arm and the humerus has, can, can, uh, can complete the motions and the movements needed in athletics. And you can see the biceps tendon is right here, which is important for slap lesions, or superior labral uh, anterior posterior lesions. So type two is the most common, and that's when the um, the, super, the, the labrum and the biceps tendon are detached from the glenoid rim. And when that tear, it's called a type 2 uh, slap lesion. And most of this is called, caused mostly by um, asymmetries that are caused by our tennis motion. Because um, we, we, we do the same motions over and over, the external rotators of the rotator cuff become stronger than the internal rotator the, of the rotator cuff. So the rotator cuff is made out of the supras, supraspinatus, subscapularis, the infra, infraspinatus, as well as the teres minor. And, ex and the external rotators are the infraspinatus as well as the teres minor. And the next, the next injury that I looked at were rotator cuff injuries, and that is more of a general term for an injury of the rotator cuff and the muscles and ligaments that stabilize the shoulder. Um, there's no, like, there is no one cause for these injuries, but um, they have, uh, doctors have seen two mechanisms that uh, ploy these the injuries. And the first one is tensile overload. So in tennis and in, in baseball, any overhead um, motion, the follow through, when you finish accelerating, um, it causes a lot of stress and a lot of forces on, the, on these ligaments and on the muscles. And that is potentially causing tears and injuries. And the second, um, uh, second model I saw was internal impingement, which was it's a pretty much just abnormal contact between structures in, in, the, in the shoulder. So the most common is the infraspinatus muscle uh, rubs up against the glenoid rim, and that causes tears and can cause injuries. And both of these injuries are, are overuse injuries. So these can, these can be stopped. If, if juniors, if kids are given the amount of time to rest before these injuries and they, they can be prevented, you know, these, over, inju these overuse injuries can be, can be stopped. So first I want to look at the sociological links between these injuries. So first I saw um, a lot of major trends in new sports uh, across all the board. And the first one I saw was the emphasis on, emphasis on, the, on the performance ethic. So right now, um, pretty much what fun is in new sports is getting better and winning and competing. That's what the focus is now in new sports. And the second trend I saw was specialized training programs. As you saw in the earlier picture, um, kids four and five years old, if they have see talent, if coaches see talent, they can be sent off to these academies, you know, in Florida, Spain, Russia. Um, and they're sp pretty much specialized in this sport their whole lives and they immerse, they immerse themselves in tennis 24-7. And so I also want to touch on the tennis culture. Um, there's actually no off-season in tennis. There's, there's uh, tournaments, competition, 365 days a year, seven days a week. So if you have the money, if you, you know, are that uh, motivated, you can compete every single week, which of course you know, gives rise to overuse injuries. So I want to give you some examples of uh, players you probably know who went to the academies and are succeeding now. Rafael Nadal, he went to an academy in Barcelona um, at, the, uh, at the age of 13. Uh, Maria Sharapova went to Balateri in Florida at the age of nine. And now here she's at 24. And this is Jan Silva. Uh, he made the he made a lot of news maybe four years ago because he joined an academy in France at the age of four. And so we don't know where he's going to end up, but you know, hopefully he has a bright future. But you know, there's always a lot of speculation with uh, kids at his age. And next, I want to look at sociological, uh, psychological links. And as I said before, the stress uh, stress injury model uh, by Anderson and Williams. So when an athlete uh, experiences a stressful situation. Um, maybe like a match or a tough practice, three factors, personality, history of stressors, as well as uh, coping resources, will affect the physical, uh, physiological activation of that uh, individual. And then say if that person has um, a personality traits that exacerbate stress or a history of stressors, then that person is uh, more likely to develop an injury according to this model. 
Also, along with that burnout and overtraining. So burnout is physical and emotional exhaustion for, uh, um, from the sport, from playing it. And um, a, lot of, a lot of people, a lot of students, they, they still play because of you know, financial incentives for the future and um, financial um, obligations that the parents have made. But that can create fatigue and that can create uh, an increase for re-injury. With conclusion, um, I do believe that you know, there is a social and psychological, psychological link for, for these injuries. Um, it's not just a simple, uh, you, you have a weird motion, so you're going to cause that injury. Um, also, I, need, I think we need to create plans for the future, for parents, for coaches, because they're the kids, they're the ones that are interacting with these kids daily. And f also for the future, I want to, um, after I finish my doctorate program at New York Medical College, I, I wish to further this research, um, working with athletes and hopefully, you know, finding more just like set causes and more, you know, implications of these, um, <clears throat> of these factors. So. Any questions? So how old were you all when you started to play? How many under five? <laughs> Two under five? How many under seven? Ten? Fifteen? <laughs> Why don't we just ask them when they start? <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Liz? Um, did you take into consideration, you kind of like touched on that a little bit, but did you take into consideration like the parental factors of like pushing their children to keep playing even though the child like might be tired or might not find this, this sport fun anymore? Yeah, I didn't get to actually like fit that into my presentation, but there's, there's a big perfectionism factor in tennis, especially among the parents, and like they, if they have a financial, you know, financial, um, they're funding. The kids aren't making money. If you're a junior, you don't, you can't make money, you know, legally in these tournaments. So the parents are the ones pushing them, you know, to potentially, you know, get scholarships in college or go pro, because they're making an investment in their children, and they want to get that investment back, hopefully. Julie, how important do you think it is to start really young, like age four? Um, I think it's really important, honestly. You know, from a well, also, but I want to say that it's important to start playing if you're coordinated enough to play sports at that age. But I don't think you should limit. I don't think you should specialize in one sport at that age. So I think if you, if um, I didn't get, this, I didn't. It wasn't part of my project, but a lot of these athletes they play soccer, they play tennis, they play other sports as they're go, as they're getting older. And then when they hit 13, 14, 15, they have to decide to cut one. So usually among tennis players from Europe, it's soccer and tennis. When they get to 13, they stop soccer and they play tennis. But I also think that those sports, when they combine those sports, the, it, it helps their development um, and it helps their training in tennis. So I think that but from a young age, it definitely think it has to start, start young, I think. Dr. Anderson. Uh, it's easy to understand the uh, so social and sociological pressures to competition and all, as you pointed out. And it's easy to understand how parents want to want their kids to excel and recoup their investment and all that kind of stuff. Given what you've done and you know all the conversations that you've had, what would you say is the one thing that is missing psychologically from this that we ought to that, that the trainers and parents ought to know about? Um, I don't think that I think I think a lot of uh, especially parents don't understand like the psychological pressures that. Are given to these, um, to these, uh, to these, to these, like you know, these kids, these these, uh, these athletes. Um, yeah, they're they're called athletes, but they're still children and they're still developing. They still have, you know, mental, um, you know, mental lapses. And you know, when you play tennis on the court, you're by yourself. You can't really, you don't have a coach or anyone to pick you up if you're down. So, um, I think that factor, like, it's not really recognized a lot. You know how. You know that, so that that's a big uh, reason for burnout because, you know, if you keep losing these these uh, close matches, and you know it's going to affect your mind, and you're gonna you know you're gonna question your ability, and you're gonna question your your drive to play the sport. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> it's a hard question. That was good. Molly, uh, have you ever been injured? And if so, what were the effects? Um, not not to this like not to this extent. Like when I looked at the slap lesions and the rotator cuff, in, rotator cuff injuries, those are pretty much really serious injuries. You need surgery most likely if you're gonna if you're gonna have a tear of that of um, that level. But I've had plenty of shoulder injuries, plenty of uh, I focus on shoulder, but I've rolled my ankle maybe I don't know 
eight times. But that's something also I wanted to look at, you know, re-injury, like how the mind affects re-injury and, um, you know, how, how that can happen. Because, you know, if you injure it one time, uh, biologically it's weaker, so it's susceptible to injury, but also mentally it can affect, you know, you keep thinking about, you know, that one area that you got hurt so it can get hurt again. But nothing, nothing as serious as this, and I hope, you know, nothing, nothing happens to any of us. I mean, Dr. Fleischman. So in, in the time that you've been playing tennis, have you noticed any difference? in the way your coaches train you? Like, is there specifically, have you noticed more cross-training? Uh, I think when you get to a level, um, I, I, didn't get to, I didn't get to go to that bullet point, but the elite junior tennis player, they don't just play tennis. They have to do a lot of fitness, they have to do a lot of off-court stuff, you know, in order to compete uh, you know, at the highest level, because um, at the highest level, those kids are usually stronger and they're usually bigger. But, I, but also, like, when when you go to a more national level and more to a college level, yeah, there's, I think there's a lot more cross training, a lot more, you know, running, like a lot more sprinting. But yeah, I think as I got older, I did a lot more stuff like that, you know, more weights as I got older, yeah. you know, more running as I got older. When I was younger, I did a little bit, but not to the extent of like what we experience here on campus. Yeah, I know there's a there's a high school um, uh, football team in Baltimore where they do yoga. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. I think College Park just started doing yoga also last semester. Okay, I, I, my, my impression, and I, I don't know if you, you, you personally saw this or if you, you know, read about this, is that people are starting to pay a little more attention to the fact that repetitive, any sport where there's mm -hmm. all that repetitive motion, it, it sets you up for injury and that there might be um, training modalities that can at least address some of that. Yeah, actually, it came up in a class I had yesterday. There's an article. <laughs> Because um, there was an article that my professor found that, you know, um, kids that are specializing in one sport earlier, they're, get, they're getting injured more often. Well, they don't know whether, you know, it's because of uh, biological development or just because they're playing that one sport all the time. Of course, you're going to be playing, doing something all the time, you're going to get injured more. They don't know, like, the exact causes, but, but I definitely think that, you know, as, as they get, have to get older, they have to do a lot of cross-training. That helps a lot with the tennis. Did you find anything in your research about, um, as you mentioned earlier, tennis being such an individual sport? They're out there on the court on their own versus a group sport where you do have that social support. Did you find any differences if you compare the two individualized versus group in terms of burnout and the support? Um, I didn't find anything compared to more team sports, but um, more with like the stress injury model, one of the coping resources was you know social support, and they found that you know uh, athletes with a lot of high, higher social support were less susceptible, like it's more of a buffer to injury than they found athletes with less with less social support. So, you know, your team, your, your camp plays a big, your, uh, your camp, like your group, like your trainers, your coaches, they play a big group, uh, I mean a big role in um, your, you know, your training itself, but also, you know, how your mind is, your mindset to when you play your matches and, you know, the effect of, the effect of injuries on you. That's what I found. And you got a pretty good support group. Yeah, <laughs> see? Okay. We well, don't have practice anymore, that's why, so we're free. Right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's also a reason, so. Well, thank you very much, Shane. Yeah.